Hi, I'm Amy and this is A Star Reads and it's time for week four of the Battle of the Children's Picture Books. So this week was a really hard week. Sometimes it's really hard because they were good books but they weren't my favorites and so I have to pick like which ones I liked out of the books that weren't my favorites and rank them somehow that way. But this week I had the opposite problem where they were so good and I had like six books that were so hard to choose between. It made it very difficult to pick a favorite. It made it very difficult to rank these because I feel very similarly about the top six books on this list. So if you see some of your favorites that are lower on the list and you're thinking, hey, that was a really good book. I'm like, yeah, it was a really good book. I loved most of these. <laughs> I had to go based off just what my general feelings were when I was reading it. So not only was the content amazing, but also I just got either really emotional or it made me feel very touched or it just was beautiful. And there were specific things about it that made me put it a little bit higher than some of the other books on this list. So just know that it was a really hard time this week and that most of these were really, really good. So I'm going to start with my eighth book, which is Jimmy Kimmel's The Serious Goose. Now this is a fun one. This is a really, really fun one. And I can see this being an amazing read aloud book with children. And I can see young children absolutely loving this. This is a comedy book about this goose who is very serious. And it's really hard to make this goose laugh. And you're basically going through this book trying to make this goose laugh. A lot of people were really upset about how simplistic it was and that they didn't really care for the illustrations that much. But I think, it's really effective. Like, I think it's really effective. And this would be a good book for beginning readers, I think, because the writing is very bold and easy to get through. But then also it would be a fun way for beginning readers to kind of work through these words because it is so funny. You end up not being able to help yourself, but you are laughing because it just gets more and more ridiculous. And I know that it wasn't for everybody, but a lot of the reviewers on Goodreads are adults. And I think that this is a great book for kids, for young kids. So this may not be the most exciting and fun and interesting book for me, but I think that this would be one of the most exciting and fun, interesting books if I was introducing it to my students. So I really enjoyed this and I thought that it was clever and fun and effective. Like kids are gonna love this. Are they gonna read it over and over and over again, many times through? Maybe if they're really young, I don't know about older readers. I could see this as being a great way to decompress a class after doing some heavy work, like you doing a lot of thinking, a lot of thinking, and then reading this book to kind of like get all those wiggles and frustrations and things out, this is a great choice. So I really like this. Even though it's number eight on my list, I thought it was a great option. Book number seven might be slightly surprising because I am someone who got my degree in biology and I love science and I did get my degree in evolution. So like you would think that this would be higher up in the list, but I'm going with Moth, an evolution story by Isabel Thomas and Daniel Egnius, who is the illustrator. This is a nonfiction book about a very classic case that is taught in all evolution classes. You learn about the speckled moths. So there was a time when the speckled moths were procreating more because they were more successful because they blended in with tree bark much better. So birds didn't see them as often. And so birds would go for the black moths. Well, then there came the industrial revolution where there was a lot of coal being used and it released soot into the atmosphere. This was before we had scrubbers in the giant sm smokestacks. And it caused like the tree bark to get soot on it and would become black. So then the black moths were the ones that were less likely to get eaten by birds and the speckled moths were more likely to be seen because they could, you could see their speckles. And so those would be eaten by birds and they were less likely to procreate. So you ended up getting more black moths. Since then, we've done a lot to try and fix the environment after the Industrial Revolution. And we get to a point where there is sort of an even amount of these moths. Now I'm just telling you this because this is what we learn in evolution class and this is a very classic study. And I enjoyed seeing this done in picture book form because I feel like that's a subject matter that we do teach in schools to young children, but it's really hard to explain. Natural selection, adaptation, all of that is hard enough for adults to understand, but trying to explain it to children is even more complicated. I think this was really well done. I loved the author's work. I thought that she did a great job. I know that someone was saying that they were really upset that there weren't references in the back of this because it is nonfiction. And I think that it is short-sighted. So I think that would have been nice to see those references. I, of course, have seen all the references because I've taken classes on the subject matter. So I know that this is 
very valid and accurate, but especially since we're trying to teach students from an earlier and earlier age how to look up sources, how to know when you're reading something that has valid evidence behind it. So I think that was a very good point that this as a nonfiction picture book, even though it's a picture book, should still have these sources in the back and it didn't. So that was kind of like a bit of a miss. The main reason that this is lower on my list is that I wasn't as taken by the artwork. So the artwork was loved by so many people and I get that and I get that it's really unique, but to me, I thought it was a little confusing at times. I thought it was really dark in places and I just didn't prefer that. It wasn't awful. Um, it was just not what I would have envisioned for telling this story at all. You know, telling this story about the moths. There are beautiful, beautiful parts of it. I think the moths are done so gorgeously. But then there were sections where I just thought that the writing was too dark and I thought it was a little too disjointed and it kind of made it a little harder to follow. But I was happy to see this and I was happy to read it and I'm just so excited that books like this are available. It's just not my top on the list. So now we're getting to the harder part because I really loved all these books and it was really hard to pick a favorite. So book number six I'm gonna go with Emmanuel's Dream, the true story of Emmanuel Ofosu Yeboa. And this is about this boy with a disability. He was born with what he says is one weak leg, but he was born with one leg that was not fully formed and he was not able to use it as a child. And fortunately in his village where he was born, that was seen as like a curse and that he could be bad luck because of it. But he was such a strong boy. He was such a strong boy. He worked really hard to show people that he could do things that they didn't expect him to do. And to make friends. Like he never let anything stop him. He was so positive and confident all along. And it was impressive. And he would just try things over and over and over again. The first time he'd try to get on a bike, he kept falling off, but he just kept trying and he persevered. So this is an amazing book of perseverance. And I thought that the art was really beautiful and appropriate for this story. I thought that it really set the tone and I loved it. It was so good and it was very inspiring. This boy's journey was incredibly inspiring. And this is a true story. This is based off Emmanuel who did end up riding his bicycle around Ghana. And in the end, it improved the rights that people with disabilities in Ghana have today. So he was really, really impactful. And this was a very important book and I really did enjoy it. All right, so for book number five, I've got another amazing book. And this is On the Trap Line by David Alexander Robertson. And it's illustrated by Julie Flett. This is about a grandfather who grew up on this trap line out in the wilderness where he grew up with his family and his friends. and. They, the whole family has since moved away to the city, but he wants to go back and see his trapline. And traplines are where you do your hunting. And he wants to share that with his grandson because his grandson's never been to a trapline before. So he takes his grandson on this journey. And during that whole process, he's telling him about his upbringing and what he remembers of his time there and some of the things that he did along the way, but then also takes him to the trapline and tells him the importance of that to his culture and to their family so that they could survive, so that they could eat. It was such a beautiful reminiscent experience seeing this grandfather share his life with his grandson. Then also learning about this Swampy Creek culture that we don't necessarily get to hear about very often. And I've said this before, I just love the work that David Alexander Robertson is doing in trying to bring these stories to children. I feel like the artwork was pretty understated, but I thought it was really appropriate for this story because the story is kind of silent. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a reverent sort of hushed way. It's this reminiscent time and I thought that the artwork matched the voice of the storytelling very very well. I really loved this. I loved hearing this familial story. I loved seeing how the grandfather is trying to show the grandson his culture and try to maintain that cultural connection that gets lost a lot of times with globalization and different things that are going on. So this was a really good book and I highly recommend it. All right, it's time for book number four, which is Ho'onani Hula Warrior by Heather Gale and illustrated by Mika Song, Mika Song, not sure. This is about a real person named Ho'onani who is a mahu, which is someone who embraces male and female traits. And this is the story of their childhood when they were in school and they loved to sing and they loved to dance and they loved to participate in all the performance activities that would go on during school. So at one point there was a Kane warrior dance that was gonna be performed by the high schoolers. And this is typically for just males, but Ho'onani wanted to try out. And this is the story of 
that process. And Ho'onani actually ends up receiving a lot of encouragement, but their sister has a really hard time accepting the fact that they don't embrace their femininity necessarily and that they try to express their male qualities. And Ho'onani wants to, wants to get the point across that that doesn't mean they're not feminine, it just means that they also embrace masculine traits. So where this is very similar to Sparkle Boy, which I mentioned in my video I think last time or two weeks ago, I think that I enjoyed this version of that conversation around gender a little more than I enjoyed Sparkle Boy. Nothing against Sparkle Boy, I thought it was really good, but this touched me more. And this gave me more of what I wanted from that conversation. And that this, this is for a slightly older audience, and so I can see that it would be a little different. I just think that this was handled so well, and I liked seeing that cultural component. I've been looking at books that are set in Pacific Oceania, and there's not as many children books that are, at least not in English, that I can access or that I can get at the library. So I do have a few others that I will be checking out, but I wanted something that was from a slightly different culture. I really enjoyed the confidence that this character portrayed. It was so beautiful. I highly recommend this book if you get a chance to pick it up because it's just charming. I liked the artwork because I felt like even though maybe it wasn't my favorite art style, it expressed this culture and these characters in a way that made me really see what this story was supposed to be. Okay, so we're getting into my top three and these ones were not necessarily better than the last ones. It was just that these were more emotional for me and these were the ones that touched me a little bit differently. So we're gonna go with Dear Librarian, written by Lydia M. Sigworth, illustrated by Romina Galata. So I picked up this one because it does talk about this family, a pretty large family. There's seven children and two parents that are homeless for a short time and they do have to depend on their family members. They're kind of hopping from house to house and they don't really have a home. And our young character finds her home in the library. And this is a letter to the librarian that helped her through this difficult time and gave her a home. And this is nonfiction. So what was funny is when I started reading this, it's forwarded by Ira Glass from This American Life. And I've listened to a lot of the podcasts from This American Life, but not a ton. I've listened to other podcasts a lot more. But when I started reading this book, I was like, oh, I remember this podcast. So uh, if you get a chance to check out This American Life, I don't know what the name of the podcast specifically for this librarian one is. Maybe it's called Dear Librarian as well. but. It is the story. And so it was kind of fun to read this story written by the woman that the podcast was about. And it was, it was so good. Now, let me say one thing before I go into this even more. And that's, in my children's literature course, we were talking about what makes a quality children's picture book. And one of the things that you're supposed to kind of steer away from is sentimentality, adult sentimentality in children's books, because then it's more for the adults and less for the children. Children are not as interested in that sentimental element that adults are reminiscing about. You're learning this child's experience, but it's really her reminiscent about her own childhood as an adult now. There's nothing wrong with that, but I have been told that these books tend to be less interesting for children and tend to be more what adults want to read because they want to reminisce about their past. They want to reminisce about librarians, how much they love librarians and how much librarians have shaped their life and touched their life. Now, all that being said, I still love this book. Like I really love this book. I cried, I didn't sob, but I cried quite a bit reading this one because it was so touching. I could understand this woman's perspective. I mean, I was never homeless myself. I could understand the impact that going to the library, feeling like it was home, having someone care about you enough to make you feel like you're at home, how that felt. Like, I, I totally get that. I think librarians would love this book. I'm hoping that kids would love this book. I just don't know how well it would would reach children if they would be as interested in this because it really is like a tribute to librarians. The artwork is gorgeous. There's all these moments of imagination, which are fun because she's basically talking about how this, this home, this library has become this different world for her. I am just not sure how well received this would be by children. So if you know, if you've read this to a child, let me know in the comment section down below. I would love to know if I'm wrong. That's, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to learn. Okay, book number two is a gorgeous book that touched my heart and it's 
also like Sparkle Boy in the sense that we have this conversation about gender and what society deems as masculine and feminine and how we can break that mold and look at gender in a different way. And that is Julian is a Mermaid by Jessica Love. And this is so beautiful. It's very simplistic. There's not a lot of words on this. This is almost like a wordless book. It's not, but there's just not too much writing in this one. So it's more about the images and the emotion conveyed in the images. It's about Julian, who is very young and loves to dress up and is afraid of disappointing their abuela, but it ends up turning out that they get the support they need. And it's just, it was so beautiful. And this is one of my favorite art scenes in here. It just shows you how beautiful this artwork is. It is incredible. There's a lot of symbolism in the colors and the patterns in this. So even though there's not a lot of words that are spoken in this, it does a great job of bringing you through the story and seeing how different parts of the story connect with other parts. So like, I'm a big fan. If you get a chance to read this one, absolutely love it. It is a beautiful way to discuss gender and gender norms. So I really like this one. And finally, book number one. I'm really excited that this was my number one pick because this one actually honors Black History Month, which we are currently in in February. And it is the perfect representation of Black History Month. In picture book form, I loved The Undefeated by Kwame Alexander and Kadir Nelson. And this is stunning. It's not a poetry collection, it's just a, a lyrical book which has one long poetry that goes through it, but the artwork is incredible. And it brings in different people from history, from Black American history, in different ways. And the verse does an incredible job of bringing in these Black historical figures into this historical narrative in a sense. It's not a narrative, it's a poem, but we're talking about periods of history and I just loved the subtlety of it, but I was able to recognize where the influences were. I think this is a great way to introduce other parts of history and to talk about these significant figures when you are going through this book. So for example, it says, this is for the unbelievable, the we real cool ones. And this is a very famous poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. And in the back of the book, you've got this section that talks about the individual characters that are either portrayed in the pictures or portrayed through little quotes in the poem in this. And I thought that this was wonderful because like, this is a great comprehensive history. It's very, very brief on each topic it touches, but it's a great place to start. It's an amazing place to start. The poem itself is incredible. The artwork is stunning. And I think that this is a wonderful way to introduce these historical figures into your class, to start subject matter, to learn about black history. And I just, was so blown away by this. And just the fact that I read this this week and it's Black History Month, it just all came together so well. And it was touching, it was moving, the artwork punches you in the face and sometimes, and I don't mean, literally, I just mean like, you turn the page and you're like, <gasps> and it takes your breath away. It was so gorgeous. And sometimes I'm realizing with these picture books, the ones that are based on poetry that are in verse are really, really emotionally impactful. I have found that to be true for a couple of others that were in my top ratings that were poems and they are so good because there's so much emotion you can convey with poetry that you don't convey as much in prose. And I don't actually think that this has to be for a younger audience. I think that this will work for a younger audience, but I think that this is also a great way to introduce this history in say a high school class. You could read this to your class before discussing some of these famous people or talking about the period of slavery, civil rights, Jim Crow, even current times there is, a lot of current Black American famous people in here as well. So I'm definitely gonna recommend this. I think this is a beautiful book that everybody should pick up and enjoy and just be in awe of because ugh, it's, it's really, really well done. So that's it. That is my week four. I had a really good week reading children's books. It was difficult because there were very emotional ones this week, but there were a lot of ones that made me learn a lot. And I like that. I like children's books that are interesting and well done and beautiful but also have something a little deeper. And that was a theme this week. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you can see what happens on week five. I've still got, look, I've got tons of books there, but I've also got a ton of books on that chair there. So I just keep bringing in the children's picture books and I'm gonna have way more than I was supposed to read. Like by the time I end this, I'm gonna have read like 70 something children's picture books and I was only supposed to read like 40 somethings. <laughs> going a little overboard, but I'm having a lot of fun doing this for my channel. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you later.